So, and uh, um, I hope that is okay. So I'm literally sitting here in a trailer. And um, let me share my screen then. So here we go. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about passive houses and passive house standards and how to achieve that, because obviously that is where the building code is going. Um, and uh, passive house so far has exceeded that code, but we have New York State already a, a very good, I feel, energy code uh, in order to um, to address all those things and build it, buildings extremely efficient. Now, there is a very nice study, um, at least I feel, uh, from the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. They've done, uh, they had a couple partners there uh, who, with whom they, they were going in and uh, looking at uh, a database which they have. And that database is the, um, essentially the database of a lot of buildings here in New York City uh, we're talking about um, about 1,600 New York City multifamily properties uh, and their energy usage, both before 2003 and then after 2003. And you see here, the this is really measured uh, and sometimes really granular measured. So this is actually a very valuable piece of information. And then you see here different kind of passive houses and the number you see in here is the uh, key BTU per square foot per year. So these are 85,000 BTUs per square foot in the older buildings. And the newer ones obviously are a little bit more efficient built after 2003. And then you got into the passive houses. So C1 and C2 is, are actually some early adapters of passive house standard. They're still gas heated uh, and uh, but they are actually applied uh, early passive house standards. They have uh, window air conditioned units with specific covers for them. Um, and uh, then they have also uh, the uh, more strictly passive house standards. So C, C3 C through C6 are all electric buildings. Uh, and uh, uh, three of them are, or two of them are passive house certified. Uh, one of them is applying for the passive house certification. I guess the first one here uh, doesn't want to bother with it anymore. And this is actually the 30 BTUs, KBTUs per square foot is actually the target of passive house. Um, now you can, can argue that different standards sometimes with passive houses are also different passive house organizations. Uh, however, you know, this is really the target in New York City, a lot of the institutions want to have to achieve. And uh, as you see, none of them actually achieves all this. Even the buildings were electrically heated. Uh, they are, uh, and they are, uh, by the way, all the passive houses they had built are on gas for domestic hot water. And... Um, but they're electrically heated and they don't achieve the passive house target. As you can see, when you actually measure them. Uh, the end, the uh, were those yes. electric? Uh, was it, in, was it, uh, what kind of electric was it? Were there air source, ground source? Uh, no, no, no. They, none of them, none of them are ground source. They're all electric. Um, and, uh, they are, um, resistive heating. Oh. And, and then some of them were uh, actually air source. So some of them are electric resistance, yeah, C3, C4, I believe, and then C5, C6 are, are air source. And uh, um, and uh, the, um, but they're all on, on, on gas heated uh, for domestic hot water. But uh, C5 and C6 are passive house certified. But like I said, if you then measure them, they, they're, there's a lack of, uh, agreement between and this is where really part of the report focuses on there there, there is what they call mod modeling versus reality um in reality um you know you have twice as many people living in there uh, specifically in the affordable houses uh, you have more appliances computers tvs in there 
uh, you have pets uh, which get washed and uh, um, we, we've seen that multiple times here at NYCHA buildings that the domestic hot water, for example, is twice as high as it is. And uh, uh, in, in, if you apply the normal 20 gallons per person per day value. And uh, we've also found that sometimes there are twice as many people living in there than there, there should. And the thermostat goes up and down and everybody regulates it. And sometimes the problem is if you don't pay for the energy, you don't really conserve it too much. So the windows open in the middle of the winter uh and or uh, in the middle of the summer when you but there's still air conditioning or heating running so um so that's that's really the reality there so i want to compare that a little bit what we have achieved where we now had put geo in some some buildings uh the the first building you might have heard about is zero place in, in new Paltz was aimed to be uh, net zero or is very close to being net zero um i think they they achieved 98.5 uh, percent uh, they only joined over the year 1.5 percent from the grid and um, it's a, a 48 uh, apartment uh, a correction 46 apartment with six commercial spaces in the in the first floor and uh, if you're looking at that building from the top it looks like a spaceship almost uh, they plastered everything they could with uh, uh, solar panels but and um, and even even the awnings here on the southern side are solar panels, so that, I thought that was a pretty cool touch here. Um, making but none of the data you see the solar is accounted for in, because we wanted to see you know where are we without it. I mean this this building is very close to net zero. Uh, last year it was off by one point five percent, but uh, it has, it's essentially ninety eight percent net zero. They would have had a little bit more room for a little bit more solar panels. They would have probably achieved that goal much uh, uh, very easily, but uh, this is pretty much what I call as good as it gets. Um, a lot of uh, passive house concepts there, very extremely well insulated, no giant glass window fronts. Um, uh, they they are really putting uh, a lot of effort into efficiency in that building. Now this is just to to uh, exemplify. What was going on during the peak day in this pretty much most efficient building we could come up with? And uh, that was last year, January 4th, and it was minus six degrees Fahrenheit outside uh, during the night. And that entire building used, as you can see here, 133 kilowatt kW as, as the demand. And uh, that was all so this is the energy demand. This is not the demand on the grid, but this is um, this is the energy demand, and this is the el electrical appliance demand. What you see here, this is the most efficient building we could build or we would come up with, and still 90% of the peak demand is coming from heating and domestic hot water. It just points out how dramatic high that load is during peak and it will and it does drive the entire peak in the state so this is really the big challenge to convert over all that energy to electricity which is served by the current gas network and it's all about the peak at the end of the day now if you now look not just at the peak hour the peak 15 minutes but you look during the day, you see this profile here. Again, this is total demand. This is not the, the load on the grid. This is the heating demand is 90% of the overall demand and the rest is for appliances, for elevators, for everything else. So the, uh, um, the electricity usage there is here. And the question is, how did we satisfy that demand of the building? Again, this, if we would run a COP of one, it would be 119 or 120 kW. Now comes in the geo system, and you can see where actually that energy was coming from. This is again the peak 15 minutes at 7.30 in the morning.
Mm. Uh, elevators, everything else. About 35 kW came actually from the grid to power the geosystem to run the compressors. And as we know, all that heat ends up, or all that energy ends up at heat in the apartments, essentially. But about 84 kW, 70% came actually from the ground. And that is something we always try to emphasize now, that this is stored energy in the ground, which we're extracting. And this is what is reducing so dramatically uh, the, the draw on the grid even during those extreme peak hours. So in other words, here's the, here's the thermal load of the building, the 120 kW. Again, we're at peak time 84 came from the grid, but, but only, uh, uh, I'm sorry, out of the, the ground from the thermal battery, but only 35 then came actually from the grid. So the thermal battery dramatically reduced the draw on the grid here. And it's interesting how this was shifting and how the, the ground was responding to larger demands. So in other words, you have the, the peak demand at 7.30 in the morning. This is when the contribution from the ground is also going up. So it's not, while it's not dispatchable, it is actually responding in a fashion like almost a dispatchable battery by increasing its capacity, it's delivering during the peak times when the demand is the highest. So you, you see it follows completely the, the heating demand here. And uh, that is almost like a dream because it's automatically built in. So that all now was reducing the, the demand on the grid coming from the HVAC system and the domestic hot water, which is a dark blue line here. And it was again, the height in the morning but it was interesting that the building peak was not in the morning when we expected it. It completely took us off surprise. It actually came in in the evening around 5.30, 6 o'clock when people came home and were turning on their dishwashers and their appliances and their washing machines and everything else. In other words, the demand was not driven by heating and cooling anymore in this building because the ground had reduced the demand on the grid so much that it's actually driven by regular appliances, et cetera, and was shifted into the mm -hmm. evening. That was a shot for us because uh, that is actually very good because we, we can use batteries to bridge that between the sun going down and the demand going up like this, like it is today. The, 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 the bad thing about supplying a long demand during a cold night is that you need no battery storage for 12 hours uh, and not here for a couple hours to look at your peak here. So in other words, the, the, the ground or the contribution of the ground battery was so high that it shifted the energy use from the grid into the evening. Um, and uh, this is, and it was not, not higher then a normal building was doing without actually uh, any kind of heating and domestic hot water load on them. So that was all fascinating for us. Um, we felt that was very encouraging that if you build a building that way, you have a grid now, which is actually large enough to supply the total energy to the building without having any additional peak impact despite being electrified. And this just summarizes that, that the total energy load of the building was reduced by the geosystem and by the vast, essentially this came all from the ground. There was a contribution from the ground. So we started here, the total energy, but because of geo, it was reduced to this, which, was, which is essentially less than an average building like this would use today uh, without actually heating and cooling and domestic hot water. Now we ended up here, if you now look at our graph here in terms of total energy use for the year, this was now performing at, at almost 60% of what the passive house target was. So the total energy use of the building was around 17.2 uh, kBTU per year. And, we, and this is now measured, not modeled. Now the question now is, well, the question we had back from the PSC was, 
well, this is all great. This is very encouraging. But I mean, this is a super efficient building where you went with the extra mile with everything. How is that if we, number one, have a building which is just built by electric, a, a normal, uh, which is electrified, which uses geo, and uh, it's just an average building according to New York State Energy Code or a code minimum compliant building. And what are we going to do with all those affordable housing buildings, those brick buildings, who are, you know, who need to be retrofit? And uh, so I looked up some uh, data we had, and I didn't know that this was important for the PSC or for uh, DPS uh, who were mm -hmm. asking those, those questions. So we have the Lockport Housing Authority. These are built in 1971. And uh, uh, there are some old double pane windows in there, and there's some fiberglass insulation, R13 in the walls, like it was building standard at that time. And we did nothing to the building but putting in a geothermal system. And we put the, the geothermal system um, on uh, making 100% of the domestic hot water and making all the heating and cooling. And it's interesting, you see, this is the transformer for the entire development and the entire buildings are on one meter. So we have a very good, not very granular, uh, but we know how much energy this was using before geothermal and we know how much energy is using after it. it this example is simply delivering one answer you simply put in a geo system and how much does it take down the energy profile and the energy use and that in a larger multifamily and by the way it was electric heat before for both domestic hot water as well as uh, heating and cooling and the interesting part, because they do not have a gas connection on site. And uh, so it, we knew it was a 100% efficiency before. How are we doing now? And it was interesting that this development was actually pretty much like the, the early adapters of passive houses before, because they were 100% electrified already. So they were running with 100% efficiency while the comparison here from New York City, they had, uh, you know, they were still gas heated, uh, but they were built as, as passive house early adopters. Uh, so pretty much just by having something in an electric heat, you already have achieved um, the comparable passive house performances uh, we had there. And now you're putting in geo and now you drive this down uh, to after the geo conversion, the system was performing at very close to passive house target, but, but better than all the other uh, passive houses they have in their database here in New York City. So I found that pretty astonishing that the take home message here is you take an old building, in this case, 50 years old, and you do nothing to it, but putting in a geo system to make heating on hot water and do the AC and you achieve passive house target with it. Wow. So that was my, my eye opener here. And then what we did is we compared it. Uh, here's a, a couple, some of you maybe have already seen that data. So this is before and after. This is actually the total energy use in kilowatt hours. You can see it goes up in the winter time. So this is January here. Uh, and then it goes down again. And it was interesting that uh, a lot of those had um, the, the tenants were using air, uh, air conditioning per as, as uh, the window air conditioners. And now they have all central air conditioning and the geo system by being so much more efficient actually reduced the summer demand significantly, but obviously it drove down way the winter demand here. Or oh, this is not the demand, this is the, the total amount. Here's the demand. Pretty much the same story. We're driving down significantly the summer demand, despite everybody being now having air conditioning and having central air conditioning. And uh, obviously the winter demand is cut them more than in half, uh, which is, is quite an achievement here as well. So 
now the last question we wanted to answer, or we we followed up with uh, the PSC here. This is in 2017 building in Buffalo, New York, which was quote unquote only done by following the energy code, code minimum, like it is today. Nothing else, nothing special, except it has a geo system, 100% hot water, all heating, all cooling. Uh, the, the geo system here is underneath the building, is that exactly the way it is at zero place. And um, it was interesting what the performance was. So uh, we achieved about 21 uh, kBTU per square foot per year here in terms of energy performance. That means if you now take a building where you do nothing else with code minimum and you put in a geo system, you are immediately about uh, a third below passive house target. Sure. And uh, uh, so, you know, those three examples, I think, are very encouraging. It shows you the advantage. It's really the thermal battery which is achieving that, the distribution of that or the contribution of that thermal battery. And, and this is really, you know, everything else we, we, we have uh, here. So the ground is able, as we can see, uh, of supplying 70% of the needed energy capacity here. Uh, it is the needed energy capacity we, we have calculated to be about 123 gigawatts in New York State. This is at least what is currently supplied by the gas network during um, during the coldest, coldest day of the year. And uh, this needs to be done by electricity. And this is where, this is a scary number. Keep in mind that uh, we are only increasing this from 120, uh, we are only increasing um, the, the load significantly. Um, and the load of the building is pretty much the same. We need to, we simply need to find a way to, to reduce the draw on the grid. And that's what our, what we call the ground battery is doing. So the 123 gigawatts, put it in perspective, we have about 40 gigawatts or 39 gigawatts of total reserve capacity in New York state. The biggest peak we ever seen was around 34 gigawatts in the summertime. And the highest peak we've ever seen in the winter was about 25 gigawatts. So we're talking about adding about 100 gigawatts to that load. So we need to do everything else we can to reduce that. And, um, you know, geo is capable of doing so. It can reduce it by about 70 gigawatts because that's what can come from the ground, uh, assuming that every single building has a geo system. But in my opinion, we're slowly getting there, at least in new builds, where we have to have a discussion about whether we're going to, what we're going to do here. Um, are we going to, build out the grid and make it relatively inefficient? Or are we going to invest into geosystems so we don't need the grid? Um, and we can have a very, very nice load number uh, or load percentage or load factor, as you've seen uh, uh, in those graphs. Uh, so we immediately install achieve passive house standard, no matter if we have an old house or new house, just by putting a geosystem in. And even without significantly improving the envelope. So in my opinion, this is really the only way we can achieve our goals here in the CLCPA. And I yet have to see any technology which can compete with that. So that's what I wanna, wanna do is I wanna have a discussion about it if we can and have everybody chime in and give me your thoughts. I think that the message is quite simple, but on, on the other side, quite intriguing. No matter what you do, you take a geo system, you pop it into a building, you have a passive house standard. So should we do that? Should we prioritize in that? Is this cheaper than doing envelope upgrades? Is this better for the grid? Is this achieving our targets better? That's the discussion right. I guess we want to have. Yeah, anyway, thank you. Good ahead. timing. It's uh, it's around 3.30. That leaves about 10 minutes for uh, questions and discussion before we get to Michael's presentation. So thank okay. you very much. Comments, questions?
Hey, Jens, can you answer the question? Is it cheaper to retrofit to passive house or to put in a geothermal system? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I mean, is it cheaper to take a house and do a deep retrofit in order to achieve passive house standard or putting in a geo? Is that the question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I can't. Uh, I mean, I've seen the retrofits. I mean, people are living in those buildings. Um, it's very difficult to retrofit when you when you have uh, occupancy. Mm -hmm. uh, I would argue, and um, you never get it down to the point where you have to have it when you build it new. Um, but I mean, I, 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 I would argue you would not achieve that either when you. I, I would argue it's cheaper to put geosystem in, definitely. Specifically, when you need to make a capital improvement, when you need to like replace your your boilers anyway after at the end of the lifespan, um, then I cannot see how you cannot do that. Specifically with the incentives today, I always count this without the incentives to get a more uh, even play field here when I run those calculations. But I think it is plus you you electrified immediately. I mean, in the past, we always, nobody prevents somebody right now still from putting a gas boiler in or put, putting, uh, uh, renewing their, their gas infrastructure as a homeowner. That might change in the future because of public policies, but I just don't see, I, I, I always tell everybody, once your heating system is ready to go, uh, you want to electrify it. And uh, while, while Geo has a premium in there, I would argue, I see a lot of people here in New York City, but also in Buffalo or in Hudson Valley, who were the upgrade to electrification or the changeover to electrification triggers a huge amount of investment into the electrical infrastructure, whether for this development, uh, we're sitting now here in New York City where uh, you know, Conet needs to reconnect or increase their connections or their power supply to buildings significantly. And, uh, you know, Geo, Geo can avoid that because they're already sized correctly for air conditioning. And the peak demand of the Geo in the wintertime is not higher than the peak demand air conditioning with a normal air conditioning system is in the summertime. So we have the power. We have the power into the infrastructure. We don't need to renew it. That's, I think, what geo shines that we are having this cost of ways. All right. I don't know, if, uh, Bill, remember that wonderful graphic from Vancouver where they. Certainly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the conclusion they came to was envelope efficiency can at best reduce your emissions. Whereas electrification, your on-site emissions, whereas electrification can eliminate them. Yeah. And so I electrification, that. That, electrification that was a great message. Yeah. Even of of a of an envelope that's filled with holes, you can still eliminate on-site emissions. It may not be terribly efficient, but you can eliminate on-site uh, emissions. Whereas if you simply address envelope efficiency, the best you can do is reduce. On-site emissions. I, I that wasn't a very great but, percent either from the the BC example. Maybe yeah. we can go to Jerry's questions. Yeah, you put them in the chat. But Jerry, if you can vocalize one of them. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I remember that that study or those studies where um, that comes out ahead climate wise. But when it comes from the uh, homeowners or the, the building owners or the residents, the apartment owners perspective, uh, my understanding is they see comfort level issues and cost issues. And that is my concern because that's a framework from which I jump. Sure, I mean, my, my point, I guess, is uh, I think it might create a shift uh, for example, with envelope improvement, you get to the point of no return, uh, where the last five percent are gonna of efficiency gonna cost you twice as much. 
uh, you can you can create a relatively efficient envelope with relatively smaller means uh, financially. And uh, so, you know, I think it's going to shift it to the point as where get you where will you get a bigger bang for the buck? Again, you have to replace uh, your your heating system anyway in 10, 12, 15, 20 years. Um, and, and, uh, and maybe until then you, for your own comfort or other means, you improve your envelope slightly with relatively small amounts of money. But then you, you, at the end of the day, you sooner or later have, you know, have to convert an electrifier. Mm -hmm. It's really good. It's Jens. Yes. I'll tell you about it later. Joanne still... needs to mute. Joanne, please mute. I'm sorry. Jeez. Okay, I remember it being framed as uh, that will be up to that. Let the consumer worry about that. And it just always hit me wrong. And I do wonder, you know, the measurable amounts. And I, I understand what you're saying. And we have to, you know, I financially come to a good balance on that. But I don't want it. I always want uh, the annual maintenance cost to be included sure. uh, and not and not getting people pissed off so they won't want to do it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the way I look at it, if you have a house that can be comfortable using gas, that is enough insulation and enough weatherization to move forward into electrification and you're going to be comfortable with electrification. And if, if you have a, a house that's not comfortable with gas, you need to do something. You need you need to weatherize. You need why, to do why don't we go to Ron's to question if we other, could? Yeah. Um, Ron, just so you know, you, you're, you're asking about the Buffalo housing retrofit. retrofit. That was actually um, Lockport Housing Authority. Lockport, sorry, yeah, yeah. And, and there, Jens, I think, can take it from there. Ron asked if there needed to be vent work. Um, was there a central domestic hot water system or was it distributed to start? No, there was a central domestic hot water system. They had it on a, a, with electric tanks. Um, and we simply replaced it with geothermal uh, for, the, uh, for the domestic hot water. And we also simply took out the electric baseboards and replaced them with console units now providing heating as well as cooling. Great. And I mean, Lockport had what uh, cheap public power, right? So was there a payback on the whole thing or? They were not looking at that at that time. Uh, they saved the three years of their capital improvement money and, uh, and spend it there. Uh, we had done their office building before and that was suddenly, I mean, there we saved over 92% of energy because they had a very inefficient gas system. Um, and um, after that, they, so they were their own guinea pigs in their in their office building, and then they let us touch their first tenant building. Um, you know they're very protective of their tenants, and uh, uh, so you know we, uh, we 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 came in and uh, and, and they're super happy with it. Uh, they they're saving enough money again for the next one. They're not looking so much at payback, but they have to do capital improvements anyway. And uh, it was actually cheaper because they didn't have any gas on site. Uh, they looked at it to bring gas on site and having an extra building built for the boiler plant for this development. Uh, and geo was about half the cost, no matter how much it was. <laughs> so, so, you know, keep in mind, we're giving away the infrastructure for gas for free. Um, to bring gas on site wouldn't cost them a dime unless it's beyond the 100 foot. Uh, and but uh, to have that capacity put in there would be quite a, 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 a bill for the ratepayer. So that's really where we're coming from. They were not looking at payback. They got a. They got actually. They were very competitive to the gas installation as 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 a comparison. But they had enough. Indeed, they had cheap power. Uh, but they also have now cheap power for the geo system. <laughs> But sometimes if energy is very cheap, it's it's tough to make a payment uh, calculation. But that was not their first motivation. They just wanted to reduce their operating costs, correct? And they had the capital budget there and they saved it for three years and then they cut us loose. Simple as that. So thanks, Jens. That was Thank that you. was great.
Yeah. Excellent, excellent presentation really makes the important points that I think we need to make on behalf of geothermal. At this point, I'd like to trans, uh, transfer over to Michael Hernandez. And as we all know, last year, New York State adopted the All Electric Building Act. I think we were all excited when that happened and we're all excited for that to move forward. But I do think we need to realize that there are steps uh, that need to be taken in the meantime, one of which is getting into the getting it into the building code and the other of which is uh, clearing any legal hurdles that might happen. And I've asked Michael to speak to those issues today. So thanks for being here, Michael. Absolutely, thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, so in October, uh, <clears throat> there was a federal uh, complaint filed, um, uh, basically um, this uh, requesting this relief, uh, that there be a declaratory judgment that the gas ban is preempted by federal law because energy use of appliances is covered uh, by federal by the Federal Policy and Conservation Act, and that there be a permanent injunction in joining the defendants, who are the Building Code Council, the Department of State, um, from enforcing or attempting to enforce a gas ban, uh, including through the adoption of the Energy Code or Building Code or any other kind of regulation that would embody the provisions of the All Electric Buildings Act. Uh, so this, um, this uh, complaint was, um, you can uh, uh, read it here. Uh, I'll put it in the chat uh, if you wanna look at the complaint. Um, <clears throat> There's a link to the to the complaint that was filed, um, and then this was filed in the U.S. District Court uh, for the Northern District of New York. Um, it is being heard by uh, uh, Judge uh, Glenn Sudeby. Uh, he is a Bush administration appointee um, and uh, was re made some recent headlines because he uh, blocked he found New York's gun laws to be unconstitutional. Um, so I uh, have a, a link for, for that, um, some of those headlines in the chat. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I think if we, if we had to guess, uh, there is a chance that uh, this judge uh, might rule that the federal government preempts New York state um, ability to, um, to do a, an all electric building act. Uh, so uh, the, the, law, uh, suit, the law firm that filed this complaint uh, is um, the same law firm that filed uh, the uh, complaint in the city of Berkeley. Uh, the city of Berkeley uh, enacted a local law electrifying all their new construction. Um, the Restaurant Association in the city sued the city of Berkeley. This law firm, the same law, uh, law firm that uh, filed uh, the complaint in New York, filed a complaint in, in, um, in California. Uh, the district court judge uh, in California said, no, city of Berkeley, you are not preempted, uh, that you're fine. Uh, that went to the appellate court, uh, circuit, which is the ninth circuit. And the Ninth Circuit held, overturned the judge and said, no, that's wrong. Uh, the federal courts do preempt um, this kind of law. And so they, pre they, they overturned and said, City of Berkeley, you're preempted by the federal government. Um, so I Michael, put in. So yep. I see Bob's got his hand off. And unless that's an old one, do you want to take questions as you go or do you want to wait? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, uh I've, I've got a question on this that's puzzled me from the beginning. That is, I understand how, you know, uh, the federal government can establish standards for how a thing is to be done if that thing is to be done. Um, but I don't understand. I, I don't think there's any federal law that requires that natural gas be installed. So I'm wondering, how does 
you know, standards which apply or rules which apply if you do a thing, how those imply that you must be allowed to do the thing at all. Um, so, so I think the, the argument that the complaint makes is that uh, the federal government, when it created its appliance standards, when it said all appliances in the country uh, should have this level of energy efficiency, um, that's the minimum level, that that was, they did that because they wanted to prevent a patchwork of regulations for energy efficiency, different states having different requirements, because then manufacturers would have a hard time selling their appliances in all the different states to match all the different requirements. And so they said, we're just going to do one uniform system. And so the, the Ninth Circuit basically said, well, when you ban um, fossil fuels from buildings, you're effectively setting the efficiency standard at zero. You could have uh, zero natural gas. Uh, and so therefore, uh, you are, you're trying to regulate appliances. Uh, and so it's a, it's a, it's, it's a very kind of uh, um, twisted argument. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, but that was the decision that they made, um, basically that you know the, the federal government has declared that these are the efficiency standards for appliances uh, for these particular types of appliances. And so uh, city of Berkeley, you can't then come and like set an appliance efficiency standard at a lower level or at a different level than what the federal government has done. Okay, so that's a framing of the issue, which it seems to me would appeal only to someone who was seeking to make the conclusion, come up with the conclusion that they did. We've I seen it's effectively zero. That's just playing with words to come to a conclusion. That's uh, that's not what either the city of, of Berkeley or New York are saying. They're not saying that the efficiency of the system must be zero. They're saying that the systems must not be. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And, and I think that there will be um, other courts, like the Ninth Circuit, uh, does not have jurisdiction over New York. We have our own circuit, the Second Circuit. Um, so that decision is not binding on us. Um, so uh, depending upon the decision in the, the district court, if it is appealed, um, it would go to the Second Circuit uh, to, to hear. Um, and so I, I think it's anticipated that we are going to hear uh, a lot of these types of cases uh, throughout the country as as different municipalities or states enact gas bans um, and then, you know, they're challenged. Um, so, so then uh, the defendants in this case, uh, the, the attorneys are the attorney general. Uh, you can see uh, some of the assistant attorney generals who are part of the Attorney General's Environmental Bureau, uh, Protection Bureau. Um, I'm just, uh, these, these attorneys who are the leads in this case, they were made some headlines recently when they uh, secured $69 million agree, uh, settlement from Bayer and Monsanto. Um, so they are also uh, familiar with, these, uh, with litigation. Um, and so, um, and I'll just kind of run through really quickly who are the uh, plaintiffs in the case. Um, it's uh, the New York Builders Association, uh, the National Association of Home Builders, the New York Propane Gas Association, the National Propane Association, the Northeast Hearth Patio and Barbecue Association, the Plumbing Contractors Association of Long Island, the Licensed Plumbing Association of New York City, the uh, electrical workers, um, the plumbing local for Nassau and Suffolk, um, electrical workers uh, in Syracuse area, transport workers union, who are the employees of National Grid uh, in Brooklyn and Queens, uh, and then uh, two um, private um, uh, fossil uh, uh, 
delivered fuels uh, companies uh, in New York State. Uh, these are the defendants, uh, Robert Rodriguez, the Department of State, Building Code Council, uh, and each individual Building Code Council member was named in, in there. Um, and so basically they're saying, you know, we, we enacted this federal, uh, uh, federal energy policy, the Federal Policy and Conservation Act of 1975. Uh, we've, lit, we've amended it a couple of times in 1987. We said we want to reduce the regulatory and economic burdens uh, for manufacturing industry. And so we're going to stop this like patchwork uh, and we're going to like just create a uniform system. Uh, they said in the complaint that states can seek to establish their own standard, um, uh, but that uh, they have to seek a waiver uh, or exception. Um, uh, and then this is the Ninth Circuit's decision in the Berkeley, uh, where they kind of say, by its pl plain text and structure, the preemption provision encompasses building codes that regulate natural gas use by covered products, including those that prevent such appliances from using natural gas. So that's what, what, the, what the Ninth Circuit held. Um, and so um, the judge uh, uh, has given the Department of State um, and the Building Code Council until December 18th to file their defenses and answer. Uh, and then they will move forward with uh, their litigation. Um, in the meantime, uh, last week, NYSERDA met with a special board meeting to discuss the cost effectiveness methodology. Whenever there's an update to the energy code, a, a cost benefit analysis has to be done. What are the costs associating with required this energy efficiency measures? And then what are the benefits of those energy efficiency measures? If the, if the benefits are greater than the cost, then it's considered cost effective and the building code council can approve that, um, that, upgrade, that update. Uh, but if the costs are greater, they can, that's not cost effective and they cannot approve it. Um, Robert? Uh, do the costs that they consider include the health impacts, one of the issues we've had with the Public Service Commission is that they look at climate costs due to CLCPA, but they completely ignore the health impacts, which are short term and exceed in many cases the monetized uh, value of the climate impacts. NYSERDA's proposal does not include the averted health impacts, which is one of the criticisms of that cost effectiveness methodology. Um, and um, the statute that was enacted, the Advanced Building Codes and Standards, which required NYSERDA to create this cost effectiveness um, methodology, specifically said NYSERDA include societal and secondary impacts. Um, and so we argued you should include the health, averted health impacts in, in the benefits of this, of these uh, um, updates. Uh, but they did not do that. It went before the NYSERDA board. Some of the board members uh, fought, uh, pushed back really hard on the proposal, saying that NYSERDA needs to do a better job of calculating the benefits of uh, upgrades to energy efficiency in the code. Um, and that they, and so, uh, but they ultimately did pass that methodology and it is going into the SAPA process, the State Administrative Proceeding Act, um, this month, late this month or early January. Uh, so there will be a comment period where people can submit comments on that cost-effective methodology. One of the benefits of it is that it used to be you only calculated energy savings for 10 years. This extends it out for 30 years. One of the, one of the victories we had here was that they they wanted to uh, they initially proposed including the costs related to property tax. How much more are you going to pay in property taxes based on the improvement of the cost effectiveness me measures? We argued they should not include that. They ended up taking that that out of the the cost benefit analysis as a criteria. Uh, the meeting happened on Friday. The Building Code Council met. 
um, they um, they basically there were several members who pushed back against um, updating the energy code to reflect the All Electric Buildings Act and some of the other electrification laws. They said that they didn't agree with it. They didn't want to support it. The chair of the council said, if you don't agree with those laws, you can vote against approving uh, approving the 2024 update. And so that's really controversial that a council that's been created legislatively uh, to implement the, the requirements of the law as directed by the legislature would then say, well, if we don't agree with the legislature, we can just not do what we've been directed to do. Um, so, so that's very problematic. Uh, the, the all the versions of the energy code that have been uh, posted or issued from the uh, Department of State so far have not complied with the electrification laws. The division has said that they are going to uh, have uh, energy code version 3.0 at the March meeting and that that will comply with the energy law, uh, with the electrification laws at that time. Um, so that's a, a, a quick update on kind of what's been happening uh, with litigation and uh, regulatory implementation. Michael, uh, thanks so much. Yeah, Questions? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I got a quick one. Um, is it the same logic then that, I mean, that municipalities and states shouldn't even be allowed to have building codes if it's against the federal, uh, et cetera? Is that the same logic? I mean, we shouldn't have any rights. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think it is a, a, a twisted logic that they're utilizing um, at the, in the Ninth Circuit, uh, and I'm hopeful that the Second Circuit will, you know, not uh, not be aligned with the Ninth Circuit. I am concerned that this district court judge, the trial court judge. Uh, Sotheby will align himself with the Ninth Circuit decision. Michael, I have a question, which is, I thought you said that the SEPA process is starting relative to the code council um, codes, yet they're not going to file them until March. Did Am I hearing that right? Yeah, so uh, there's two separate SAPA review happening. One is on NYSERDA's cost effectiveness methodology. Okay, sorry. That one is beginning uh, end of December, early January. And then there's um, an energy code update that will be beginning probably in March after this energy code 3.0 is made public. Thanks. But but the, the, method, the cost effectiveness methodology has to be uh, created first so that they can apply that to the energy code to make sure it's cost effective. And just, just uh, it's, if anybody else has a question, please ask it. But I'm wondering just the tone of the meeting, I wasn't able to attend it, the codes council meeting. Did it seem like there was a majority kind of sympathy with this notion of, of voting to not have the codes be uh, in compliance with the law, or was that just something the chair said to kind of ameliorate some of the folks who were squawking? Yeah, I think I think it's the latter. There was just like you know two members who were very vocal about how they did not want to comply with the law, um, and that was the response by the chair to them. Um, and then Claudia Bramer was supportive of you know, complying with the electrification law, but other members were silent. Um, so it wasn't really clear on where the other members are at this moment. Thanks. Bob? Yeah. If the federal government is supreme, then given that EPA has published BenMap and COBRA and a number of other systems for estimating the health impacts, would it, it be appropriate to say that given the federal government's supremacy that their estimates should be adopted and um, and just end it right there? As I put in chat, the COBRA's estimates of the impacts of residential combustion is between six and $13 billion a year. Um, 
given federal government supremacy, isn't that sufficient to just say these are the costs, be done with it? I um, I don't have an answer on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> they are. Uh, good afternoon. Um, the person that Michael referred to that pushed back, uh, one of the two, if my recollection is correct, they uh, they spent a lot of their uh, comments on the grid isn't going to be able to handle all of the electrification, and it it lends itself perfectly to what Jens was talking about. Uh, and no surprise, he was a developer. That's right, yep. All right, well, with that, we are at four o'clock. I wanna thank everybody for uh, spending this hour late, late in the week with us and uh, stay tuned for the next session. Uh, appreciate everybody. And take care. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Have a good one. Good Thanks, knowledge. Bill.